And the next presentation is quite far, uh, quite far away from us. Uh, it's uh, from Phoenix. It's uh, 7.30 a.m. over there, so it's uh, early morning. Uh, the presentation uh, name is uh, Future of Education, Educating the Third Millennium Computational Thinking, uh, Model Thinking, and Computer Coding for U.S. Common Core Standards with 6 to 12 years old students and teachers. So on the next presentations, we will see how uh, we can teach uh, children at age of 6 to 12 to code HTML, JavaScript, and these kind of things. I've actually seen those uh, kids a uh, few months ago, and they're really doing an amazing job. Uh, the presentation will be uh, led by Jeff Billings and the team from Paradise Valley Unified School District in Arizona, the USA. So Jeff, I'm passing you the word. The stage is yours. <laughs> The virtual stage. Good morning. Can you hear me okay, Joseph? Yes, we are fine. And can you see the slides? Everything coming across? I've got a slide there, computational model thinking. Yeah, everything's perfect. Okay, sounds good. Uh, I appreciate it, and uh, I guess it's good late afternoon or evening uh, where you're at. It's uh, morning here. Uh, my name is Jeff Billings. I'm the IT director of Paradise Valley School District, which is about 34,000 students, K through 12, what we call K through 12, uh, in northern Phoenix, northern Scottsdale, Arizona. And um, we started an initiative a short time ago, and we have a, a, a cadre of teachers, and you're going to be listening to three of our, our leading uh, educational uh, uh, technology uh, teachers and educators in Paradise Valley, uh, also teachers, uh, gifted teachers uh, in the what we call the K-6, which is, uh, I don't know, 6 to 10, 11-year-old kind of age students. So with that, I'm going to turn it over, and I'm going to be, uh, feel free to ask questions, or you wait till the end. I'm going to turn it over, I believe, to Janice, and uh, she'll tell me to advance uh, slides. Janice. Okay. Morning. Thank you for having us. So as um, Mr. Billings was saying, we began this initiative last spring, and um, the students that um, Joseph saw were my students from last spring starting to code with HTML. Um, so the next slide, please. Um, so, also new, uh, relatively new to the United States is what's called the Common Core Standards. They're internationally benchmarked, and there's several shifts that are required with these new standards, um, requiring focus, depth, coherence. And uh, along with the Common Core, we thought, okay, coding is a perfect way to, for uh, us to integrate the two and weave the two together because of the requirement for critical thinking, problem solving, um, use of evidence, data analysis. It all melds so nicely with um, what's required in computational thinking. So we started in the last spring, and we're continuing this year. Next. So um, with these, as I was saying, with the Common Core, we have the English language arts standards and the mathematics standards, but it requires really internalizing the subjects in order to apply computational and model thinking, as well as coding, in order to express um, knowledge of these subjects through these mediums. So um, really, I think Patrice Gunn said it very well. Computing is not a goal in and of itself, but the means to an end. And it enables the students to take control, solve problems, and build a future based upon their imagination and creativity. So as we would all agree, I'm sure it's just it's technology is technology, but really it's about the people and what they can bring to it. Uh, maybe. Um, uh, there's some platforms that we're using. One is Code Academy, another is Scratch. Um, we're planning to move into some app inventions. And uh, maybe Ms. Mensing, you can speak a little bit about Tinker. Yes. And then I'll continue after when you're. Go sure. ahead. <laughs> yeah. um, can everybody hear me okay? I'm assuming yes. Spider. Yes, okay. we can. Um, my Great. My name's Karen Mensing, and I teach first and second grade. So the kids are six, seven, and eight years old. Um, and I, for the past several years, have been using um, basic forms of coding with my students. It doesn't matter how young they are, they are digital natives, they rise to any challenge you set for them, and they love learning. They are really excited, they would so much rather be 
coding and using Scratch or Tinker or a program like that than doing a worksheet or something um, lower level thinking. So with my students, um, for the past several years I've been using Scratch. Uh, this year I started using Tinker, which I find the students like even more. It's very similar to Scratch, but um, maybe a little bit more user friendly. And they create games and projects and presentations and um, virtual greeting cards and all different things using, uh, using these programs. And it's amazing. I mean, really, their thinking changes right away when I put it in front of them. You know, they are problem solvers and they're, they're, um, they're not just giving me, you know, basic recall. They are actually creating and thinking and um, analyzing, which is just awesome to see, especially in such young students. It really sets the stage for their learning, um, you know, for their learning, you know, starting, starting in first grade all the way through, and it's, it's fantastic. Okay. I can echo some of that if you want me. To. Oh, do you want yes, to speak to text, Jim? No, go ahead. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, moving from Karen, who teaches the first and second grade, the six, seven, and eight-year-olds, and then Janice has the middle group. I have the nine, 10, 11, eight, or 10, 11, sometimes training 12 age children. And I've had pull-out class before where I just had a limited amount of time with them. So now having them all day long, um, I've gotten to really bring in the coding. The Scratch and Code Academy is what we've been using mainly in our classroom. And just... The thinking processes, like uh, Karen mentioned, have just dramatically changed. The way that they think about a math problem, a science um, inquiry problem, anything, that depth of their thinking and problem solving has changed. Because they are wonderful thinkers. These gifted children have the skills to do it, but it's taking it even farther. It's getting into those math practices, that way to approach a problem, um, and the real life, they see the real world application of it so clearly. When we're doing other computational things like, when am I ever going to use this? Or why do I need that? With um, the, They're applying it now into the coding, and they see the world of opportunities that are ahead of them. And I have had parents, this is our parent-teacher conference week, come in and talk to me about the hours their children are spending at home on Scratch building things, getting ready to try App Inventor. It was too hard before, and now they're really seeing the possibilities and putting in that foundational work all of their own volition because they just want to get better at it. And it's been so exciting to see. I have one student design a game in Scratch that none of my kids want to get off of. They just can't wait to go in there like, I don't know how he built the depth he built here and the turbo speed, and I can't wait to talk to him about the code he used so that I can do something like that as well. So it's that healthy competition, too, that when one does it and can succeed with it, the others just can't wait to grab on and exceed from that learning as well. Okay, so next slide. Uh, okay, so as they were taught mentioning, there's Scratch, and as you can see, there's the XY, so it really links nicely to the Cartesian coordinates and a, a multitude of practices. Um, moving on. And um, I'm having my students blog about their experiences, um, linking them to the standards for mathematical practice. So um, in a session we did on binary numbers, um, you can see he's really applying the, bringing in the English language arts component into even um, computational thinking and integrating it with math as well. Next. And I, I just want to throw in here for Joseph, uh, this individual, we're talking a third or fourth grader, he started learning binary math on his own, Janice introduced it as part of the coding. He started learning binary math and he's got it. So I, Joseph, I wanted to pass on it's a future CCNA student here. I threw him a little exercise in sub-networking, so <laughs> amazing. <laughs> okay, next. Um, so as um, Megan and Karen both mentioned, there's um, the kids are creating games. I think the real powerful part about Scratch is that there's a design-based learning environment where kids can um, remix and collaborate with others so they can learn from one another, and that's really bringing in all the 21st century skills of communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and creativity. Okay. Um, so another thing we have our students do is we link it to the English language arts. So some students can create things that demonstrate an idiom. So here's an American idiom. Hold on, 
hold on to your horses, you know, just wait. <laughs> um, we have kids creating um, vocabulary games linked to the new vocabulary they're learning in class, um, all kinds of applications, again, to those common core standards that we mentioned earlier. Okay, next. And these are the students from last year on Code Academy. Academy. These are the um, eight and nine-year-olds doing um, communicating in, eight, you know, coding with HTML. And again, they're presenting, they're listening, they're using those um, presentation skills, um, even to a global audience. Yeah, and, and this, just to add to it, uh, as Janice said, this was, uh, Joseph, uh, this is when uh, he actually got to um, uh, participate in dialogue with some of the students through telepresence with a Chromebook hooked up uh, in Code Academy and HTML coding. So it was... It was kind of neat to do a transatlantic university professor in, in Europe working with eight, nine-year-olds in America. I, I just find that amazing. <laughs> and again, we have um, local and global audiences. So here we have some students sharing their projects to, it was university faculty, I believe, from um, a local university here. And then on the bottom screen, again, we have our international um, and global audience. And then in the lower right-hand corner, um, I, I'm in my research, I'm doing um, um, doctoral studies currently, and I'm um, collaborating globally um, to do science education projects um, with partners in China. So it's, uh, we're using the telepresence for all kinds of things and connecting the programming and coding um, in all ways. <laughs> So again, we're kind of wrapping up here, but it's all about making connections. And as we talked about, it's those eight standards for mathematical practice, and we have those in our paper. So about making sense of problems, persevering and solving them, reasoning abstractly and quantitatively, looking for patterns. Um, and we're linking that to all kinds of computer science and computational thinking practices and concepts, including binary numbers, pixels, um, error detection using parity, um, like the Cartesian coordinate system. Decision trees, a lot of discrete mathematics involved. Um, scoring to show algorithmic complexity, so how students have to be very specific and detailed in how they um, give directions. And then um, we also do robotics programming and it, uh, all kinds of math applications and connections, again, to the common core standards using programming. And um, a lot of this requires extreme, uh, extremely precise measurements, uh, specific commands, um, so on and so forth. So. And I, uh, one more thing I want to throw in here. We just started uh, programming and connecting it to robotics, and that's, that's where I'm hoping, and I know uh, Janice, Karen, and, and Megan are hoping as well, we, we start evolving it too. So we're programming not only web portals and web applications and tablet apps, but how do we interface it with machines and robotics. Yeah. Uh, we just got our first print bot printer, you know, a 3D printer, and it was supposed to go to uh, this school, uh, um, but but I broke it. So <laughs> so now I'm trying to fix it and get it back out to them. So yeah. we want students to design and create and build and commerce and all of those kinds of things uh, fed off of coding and common core. Yeah, absolutely. And it all um, links really well into 3D um, AutoCAD type of applications as well. So computational thinking in action, um, what does it look like? It really looks like um, algorithms, their kids are building that, they're making loops, they are um, exploring sequences, um, events, conditionals, operators, all kinds of things. Um, they're simulating, they are modeling, they're decomposing problems, breaking them down, um, collecting, analyzing, and representing data, and they are really using the design process in an iterative manner um, that involves experimenting and then debugging at, this, you know, at the same time, this constant cycle in order to improve and design a solution that works. I'd like to speak a little bit about, or, I'm sorry, are you finished? No, here? no, no, go ahead. Yeah, um, that's fine. About, about gamification in the classroom, um, it at times can be a little bit controversial because people just think students are just sitting back playing games, um, and I don't really think that. I think if we use gamification properly and tie it to specific learning objectives, it's actually um, 
a, in a very powerful learning tool. And I feel like that's what all of this ties into. When the, when the students are using programs like Scratch and Tinker and um, you know, Code Academy and App Builder and all that, they are creating games and playing games um, that their classmates created for a, um, a higher learning, you know, for, for higher learning knowledge. Um, it also gives students a chance to take risks in a, in a very um, friendly environment. So with these games, you know, that they may or may not understand to start, um, it's fun and they, they may fail right away, but they realize that's okay and they feel good about taking higher risks in other learning down the, down the line. I'd yes. like to agree with that, Karen, too. Oh, did you have something, Karen, no, before no. I speak? Or, I mean, uh, Janice. No, um, no. I agree. The students are, they're not just playing games. And I do think so many people think that when you talk about the gamification in the classroom. These students that we have, and all students, moving up the, the standards, the Common Core is changing the way I look at mathematics and all the subject areas. It's getting to a depth and complexity that we hit as gifted teachers but it's still making everyone rise to a different occasion and different level than they've been. And we find kids having holes all over the place all the time, especially with mathematical and computational thinking. There could be something they've skipped over or they didn't get to the depth or they just need a practice on. And to give them a drill and kill all these work, you know, papers to just practice, practice, practice a skill that they need to master, it's not going to have any meaningful impact on them, and they're not going to be engaged to do it. But if they can do it through a more gaming feel, they are so motivated. And then they get deeper into not just filling that hole and getting them, you know, computationally ready. They're ready to go deeper with those concepts. So, yep. yeah, I agree. I think if we create a fun learning environment, it, it encourages them to explore and make mistakes, and they don't feel that risk of failure. The, the risk is very low, so they're willing to explore. They're willing to figure things out and they're motivated to achieve higher levels, and they're, they're motivated to try things they may not otherwise try. Well, they, and, and they really want to make the game. Yeah. They yeah, they're like ready to jump in and make games that they've found and said, I can do that better. I can go in and I can make my own version of it for what we're looking for as a class, and it may reach a lot, a big, huge audience. Yeah, definitely. So that really ties in well with the next slide which has to do with what we're doing is not um, just having to do with um, the programming itself, but we're really developing those critical dispositions. And um, in included in that is the ability to tolerate ambiguity, um, not necessarily having a clear-cut answer all the time. And they're developing persistence um, in solving challenging and open-ended problems. They are developing confidence to tackle and un unravel very compli complex tasks. So in Scratch, how do I create another level? How do I keep my people from, you know, dying? <laughs> or, you know, it's all these things, but they're, they're complex, and they need to have confidence and persistence to tackle them. Um, along with this, as we talked about, um, have, being able to communicate and collaborate together to work toward achieving a shared goal. So a and lot Janice, of give and take. Uh, yeah. I also think that they're much more willing to take constructive feedback yeah, because absolutely. sometimes, you know, especially a gifted child isn't open to someone saying, oh, you did this wrong or this could be better. They're like, whoa, you know, they want to have done everything perfect. But with a game, they're willing to listen to the feedback that someone gives them and build from it and go tackle that problem again. So again, like just giving that confidence and opening up to accepting that nothing is perfect when it starts. I have to go back and debug. I have to go fix things. I have to go try again. And they're always striving to make it better. You know, my yeah. one student will come and be like, oh my gosh, I added this. Try it today during math rotations. You're going to love it. You know, and let me know what you think so I can change it tonight when I go home and work on it, you know, or be able to fix it when we're doing coding time. Yeah. 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 Well, I, that going home piece also ties into the uh, it's basically you're flipping. You're, you know, they're, Absolutely. they're, you're, yeah. they're, they're doing work. They're doing homework because they want to do yeah. homework. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're giving they're themselves not. homework. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to say they're creating their own homework. I mean, I, it was like Megan mentioned, it's parent conference week. So we've been meeting with all of our parents and the parents of my six and seven year old students are telling me they are coming home from school. So excited telling me, mom, I have to log on the computer. I've got to finish what I started in scratch today. And that's not coming from me. I mean, they're getting exposed to it from me, but that intrinsic motivation is all yeah. them. You know, that is their engagement that's going beyond the classroom. So they're not just leaving the door, forgetting, oh, okay, school was yesterday. That motivation and that learning is continuing. Yeah, absolutely. 
And so um, in conclusion, um, coding is the new literacy um, for our, our students, um, in addition to communicating through English language arts and mathematics. And it reminds me of um, one of Mr. Billings' favorite quote, you know, what is it? The uh, illiterate of the... Oh, uh, <laughs> li literate of the... the the illiterate of the future will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot um, learn, hmm. unlearn. Oh yeah, learn, unlearn, and relearn. Thank yes. you. So I think that's a great conclusion because really it is about um, being able to be flexible in the thinking, to be able to learn, unlearn, relearn, and again we talked about some of those computational model thinking, the new practices, and how capacity has never been better or easier. So there's a big movement in the states right now too to bring um, coding nationwide to all demographics, all ages, um, male, female, um, minorities, everywhere. So um, this is part of a bigger picture and bigger initiative within the within our within the states itself thank you so joseph i'll turn it over to you I, i'm hoping you there might be a question we're we're able to handle it in english and chinese and spanish and <laughs> russian uh whatever whatever it comes english at. for me <laughs> yes yeah. so can we go ahead with questions in the slovak language uh, no, you be my interpreter. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. I think we can give them a huge clap. So uh, I really like the way how we were presenting in this, in this panel-like discussion. It, it was very exciting. I, I really liked it. I, I enjoyed it. How all four of you were presenting one topic, and you were doing a great job with that. Uh, uh, I will take the opportunity to, to ask the first question. And you were talking about uh, gifted children uh, and how gifted children, I guess, with like, higher IQ uh, can learn and do these coding things. Have you tried to uh, implement this coding academy or uh, teach them how to code with uh, ordinary children that you have in your classroom? How does it work? Yes, I can speak to that. Um, before I taught in this program, I actually taught in the inner city, um, downtown Phoenix, Glendale, actually. Um, all um, minority children, um, parents never been to university, um, immigrants, I mean, it, it, like they were, it was um, Title I schools, we call it. So I taught in there, and um, I saw that there were children there that really needed a challenge and needed that connection like we're talking about to the real world, application to the real world. So I started um, a robotics program there, and um, I started it from si seven years old to seventh grade, so about 13 years old. Across the board, it was an incredible experience. Um, I, I, the team that I coached and I, we worked together, we spent long hours after school during holidays, but we programmed the robot. We competed in the regional championships in um, Phoenix. We won the judges award because they just really impressed the judges. And um, then we went on to compete at the state championships. And now many of them are getting out of that inner city. And actually, several of them are now attending a high school that is by admission only based on test scores. So it has really affected their lives. It has changed the path of their lives. Um, they are on their way to attending universities, getting scholarships. So absolutely, I have that experience firsthand of using programming and robotics. And they actually had to do a very complex research project along with the robot robotics to compete. So yes, I, it definitely, I, I think but, it's across the board, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it absolutely can be done, Joseph. Where, where PV's at so that you understand our initiative, what you're seeing are, are three tremendous leaders inside of PV, not just in the coding and computational thinking, but in a, in a lot of things. So. They're on the front edge helping guide us. That's what the whole process is about. But we definitely have reg what's called regular ed uh, teachers that are participating in this initiative with us. Janice, uh, Karen, and Megan, the, that caliber of people, you need to have them to help lead and carve out the pathways. Uh, but we've got schools we're already starting some after the school clubs. It's coming down the pike. It, it, what they're uncovering 
It's very, very powerful, and as Janice said, you can absolutely, there's no reason you can do it with, or there's no reason you can't do it with regular ed. In fact, in America, what we're seeing is two big problems, and it's how do we get more, more female, more girls into computational thinking, and how do we get more uh, children of color? Uh, uh, different different uh, uh, ethnicities. Uh, it we're really focused on that in PV because that's very critical to us. The national statistics are not good about it, and uh, I personally and and PV in general and the educators, we know that's a challenge. We're gonna we're gonna master it one way or another. Okay. Okay. I have. I have one more question. I don't know. Hello? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, first thing, really, I enjoyed the presentation. I caught myself starting to think that, yeah, maybe I should move to Arizona and put my kids into your school because <laughs> it, was, it was so cool. But, <laughs> but what, I'm, what I'm wondering about is, uh, you were mentioning Common Core standards and, and, and connection, but I maybe I just didn't catch it. What, what was the what was the connection? Like you, you work with gifted children. This is probably not something that's done at each and every school. Uh, how much of it comes from the Common Core sta standards, and how much is like you pushing it higher? Well, I, um, I think. Explicitly in the standards, it's not written uh, anything about coding, of it, um, but there is a huge part piece of technology that's in there. What is in the standards, in the math standards, is like, as we mentioned, is the eight standards for mathematical practice. So there is the content standards, like, you know, what the kids should master in algebra and so on and so forth. But then there are the standards for mathematical practices. And those are things like, how do we approach problems? How do we um, persevere in solving them? All those, those have clear links that at least I saw to computational thinking. The other part is in the ELA standards, the English Language Arts standards, again, there are the content standards, and then there are the um, critical dispositions that are outlined in the introduction. And so a lot of that has to do with being able to cite evidence, again, getting to that critical thinking. Um, another stand, uh, there's the Common Core Standards, and there's also the new Next Generation Science Standards, which are brand new, just coming out. Some states have adopted them, not all of them have. There are clear-cut connections there. I mean, computational thinking is mentioned explicitly in the science and engineering practices. And then, um, obviously, there's a lot of connection and overlap with the um, technology into those science standards. So down the line, I can see more connections being built. Also, a big part of Common Core Standards is depth of knowledge, which is the complexity um, and the depth of understanding um, to answer a question or um, on an assessment-related item. So by using these kind of things, they are, they're getting to the highest level of depth of knowledge, which is more strategic thinking, um, reasoning, abstract thinking, complex thinking. So it's more extended thinking um, that involves investigations and applications, which coding, is, that, that is coding. It is higher level thinking, it is abstract thinking, you know, it, 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 yet linear, it is all of that. Okay, thank you very much once again. It was a wonderful presentation and I think the discussions were also uh, very nice. Uh, if anyone from the audience is interested in meeting these guys, uh, either to uh, such a tools like uh, Jabber, uh, I can share contact information for them, email address, and you can start to collaborate with them as well. So once again, thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Megan, Karen, and Janice, can you all hang tight here for just a second? Yep. Thanks, Joseph. See you all later. Okay. See you. Bye-bye.